Hey, really good to have you all here uh, on what is our first Sunday of the year. There was was the first of January, and we made the decision to to just. Uh, allow people to have family time. And uh, I heard some great stories of people just getting together and just enjoying things because church is so much more than one hour on a Sunday morning. We love this. We celebrate this. But church is community. If I haven't met you, my name is Sean. And uh, alongside my wife, Morella, we have the absolute privilege of leading this great little church community. And uh, Whether this is your day one here with us or your day 100, I trust that you will sense God's presence and feel home here at C3. Uh, There is only so much info, Jess did a beautiful job telling us, but there is only so much info that you can put on a website or or, uh, on our... And our social pages don't always tell the full story, right? They kind of tell a skewed story of what's happening in life. So... uh, Being the first time that many of us have met here today, uh, I thought I would just take a few minutes to share a little of who we are. It's kind of like a a speed dating type thing, right? So get to get to know these things here. But uh, we are a Pentecostal church. That's who we are. Uh, That we are multicultural and we are multi-generational. In fact, in the fifth row here is five generations of the Hartog family sitting here. How awesome is that? I love that. That is awesome. We are multi-generation. We actually, we celebrate diversity. We embrace family and we support community. Just talked about the fact that we've got our kids in today and we can kind of be going like, oh man, I really need kids church. You know what? We celebrate our kids team members to give them some weeks off because we are family and we celebrate family here today and we support community. In fact, our vision is premised on our willingness to walk, walk life's journeys with others. And um, we're committed. This is our, our vision statement is that we're committed to reach people who are on a journey of faith and to build strong followers of Jesus. For Morella and I, we strive... I'm just going to be a little bit personal with you here, but we strive to be, we strive to be leaders that are relational. That's who we are. We want to be connective. We want to be relational type people. Our heart as pastors is to get to know each and every one of you. But the limitations of that is obvious in that we can't do that. Although we celebrate a God who is limitless, we have limits upon our lives. And so what we do is that we speak life into being a church community where we all play a part in being connective and engaging with others. And I want to make that really clear from the start because although as relational as we are, as connective as we are, it's not about Morella and I. It's about a church community being connective. It's about us being relational together. It's about the small groups that we do throughout the year. It's about the relationships you have with other people and the way you grow and and do life with them. And that's something that we empower into our team that, that you may be celebrating with one of our key leaders, and that is part of the church. You may be in a connect group that we have, we have celebrated and given life to and prayed over those connect group leaders. Do you know what? They, they are representing us. That is life. That is our church community. It was actually Aristotle who once said this, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We are Jesus-centered, we're Bible-based, and we're Spirit-led, and much of our reach is based on being generous. We are a generous church. We are servant-hearted people, and we are committed to, seeing the vision, to, committed to the vision of seeing lives transformed for Jesus. That's what we do this for. Late last year, I actually uh, downloaded a, a vision that I have for our church that I saw here to, to some of our leaders, and it is about seeing a thousand lives transformed in the next thousand days. Yeah. You're kind of like going, whoa, okay. That's big. But we celebrate a big God, right? So, so actually, after I did that, I then became a little bit embarrassed, and I'm like, God, was that big enough? Because we want to see a thousand lives transformed in our city. Not because I need more people on a seat. I'm not interested in that. Because I know that when those thousand lives go out into the community, 
they speak life into a thousand other people. And all of a sudden, we start becoming a community. We start becoming a state. We start becoming a nation that speaks life. And that's what this is about. We believe that faith can move mountains and, and is the very key to our walk with Jesus. That hope is a gift from God to, and it helps us in those challenging moments. And that love is the very essence of our faith. In that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die for us in order that we may be saved. We are prayerful. Throughout the year, we will, just, we will do fasts, we will do prayer sessions. We have a team praying for us. Stuart Anderson has led our prayer team for the last eight years on a Wednesday night. They intercede over our church. They pray for our building. They pray for our people. They pray for our leaders. They pray for people. We, we do every meeting. We start in prayer. We are prayerful people. We are worshipers. We're worshipers. And that doesn't mean we can all sing songs. Worship mean, worshiping is the fact that we worship our God. Worship is what you put your heart into and what you do things, and we worship our God. We're worshipers. We celebrate all styles of music. Some days we have like 20 people up here. Some days we have three or four. It's not about what's up here. It's about what we're giving to God. We understand that we're all broken people in this room. Sorry to burst your bubble this early in the year, but we are all broken people. We all fall short of the glory of God. But we strive to live lives based on the foundational values of Jesus Christ. And one of them is that we're a church that speaks life. And it's that very value that we're going to explore over this next season of our church life. And I want to take this moment and encourage you to invite others to come to church over summer. It's not just for you to turn up. My heart is that you will think about the person. Right now you're going, man, I wish there was someone in my workplace could hear this. Not because I'm a good speaker, but because God's moving. Your neighbor Let's not become this shy little uh, exclusive club. Let's be strictly inclusive. Let's be celebrating and asking people. I've always said this. What's the worst thing they're going to say to you? No. Invite people. Invite people to come and hear. I was one of those kids that grew up in a Baptist church. Nothing, it's, nothing wrong with that. But that's just my life story. I grew up in a Baptist church. I grew up as a kid. And I was embarrassed to invite people to church. I was. I was like, there is no way I'm inviting my mates to come to church. The leaders at the time did a great job. And I want to honor my leaders who did a phenomenal job, who served well. But I believe God has put on this place a church where, where we can reach a community through who we are. That we can embrace people who they are. There's no condemnation and judgment. It's walking alongside people, and that's who we are. We speak life. We speak life in our meetings. We speak life in who we are. We speak life in our actions. We speak life in the things that we do. I was only reminded of the power of speaking life this week. For those who follow American football, there was an incident in a game between the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals. I'm sure many of you saw it on the news. But a young man by the name of Damar Hamlin, a uh, 24-year-old fella, suffered a cardiac arrest on the field of play. Damar had uh, routinely tackled a player as he would 20 times a game. Yet on this occasion, when he stood to his feet, he immediately fell back, and uh, whereby those noticed around him that his heart had stopped and CPR was immediately commenced. 24-year-old fit athlete, um, Collapsed in front of his teammates, in front of 70,000 people in a stadium, in front of what they said was an estimated 12,000 TV viewers. As expected, the player was rushed to hospital. A game was called off. 
And uh, as football is almost a religion in the, in the United States, most of the news and social media was full of, peop- full of people talking about and inserting the prayer emoji. And I don't know whether you saw it, they all had the prayer emoji and there's so many people who say, God, look after this person and these sort of things. And then they would get on with the rest of the day's news or whoever else won in this thing. That was until Wednesday. When a former player turned TV analysis, a guy got by the name of Dan all the sky, paused in the middle. I think we've got a, 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 have we got a clip of him there? There he is there. He was a former player. He paused in the middle of the highest rating TV show that supports the NFL called NFL Live. And he turned to his co-host. This was live to broadcast. And he turned to his co-host and he said these exact words. He said, I don't know if this is allowed anymore and maybe it's not the right thing to do, but I'm going to stop talking about the game and ask that we pause right now on live TV and actually pray for Damar and his family. He then faced the centre camera as I'm doing right now because there's multiple cameras in the studio. He faced the centre camera and he said these words. He says, I'm going to bow my head On live TV, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to pray out loud. Please pray with me, if you will. I don't know where Dan stands in his walk with Jesus. But can I tell you right now that his actions spoke life to 31 million people who were watching the broadcast at that moment. This wasn't about putting a hands emoji and saying, I'm praying for you. This was a man who on live TV risked potentially being terminated from his contract in the society and the culture we are to actually say, no, we are going to stop and we are going to pray for this young man who is dying in hospital. Never forget that our our actions and our words can speak life over not just the person you're with, but in this case, 31 million people. If you don't have a Bible plan that you're following, I'm sure you all do because you're all great theologians and you're on what day eight of your Bible plan, which is great. But I encourage you as extra reading to read the letter known as the Philippians. It was Paul writing to the people in in Philippi, and it is four chapters of Paul speaking life. That's what it is. It is four chapters of Paul speaking life. It's about, I think it's about 125, 130 verses, and I'm telling you, the majority of them is Paul, who was in jail at the time, speaking life over the believers in Philippi. So that's your homework. Turn to Philippians. It's in the New Testament. It's in the middle there. Look it up if you don't know where it is. If you haven't got a Bible, then we'd love to be able to give you a Bible. We're generous people. We want to give you a Bible. We want to see you get into the Word of God. But that's next week. Today, I want to lay some foundations for us as a church. And uh, so I want to look at a story that comes from the Old Testament book of Numbers. And I do this because I believe God is calling us as a church to have the courage of a news presenter like Dan and the courage of two guys by the name of Caleb and Joshua, who in the midst of bad news chose to speak life. Now, a little bit of context. I'm just going to speak for 10 minutes here. A little bit of context. The Israelites have made their way out of Egypt. And if you don't know the story, uh, the Israelites were really doing it tough when they were in Egypt. I mean, this was not a good life. In fact, there's a scripture I was reading through. There's a scripture where it says this. It says that Pharaoh was so hated the Israelite people that he instructed his own supervisors. He said this. He said, load them down with more work and make them sweat. That's okay. Okay. And he goes on to say, give them no more straw, but I want them to make the same quota of bricks. Like, uh, Pharaoh didn't like these dudes. And then he says uh, this, it's in the New Living Testament, he says, that'll teach them. The The story is that God rescues them from their oppression, and now here they are standing on the edge of Canaan, a land of milk and honey, uh, Go and read Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, where God promises the land to them. Scholars say that about two years had passed in this time, and it's important to note that during the journey towards the promised land, I want you to hear this, during the journey towards the promised land, uh, they, they had both seen and experienced the miraculous provisions of God. It's not like all of a sudden they're saying, God, where were you for the last two years? He led them through 
a body of water, and you can debate of how big the Red Sea was. I ain't walked through a body of water and kept my feet dry before. He gave them water from a rock, enough water to feed potentially two million people. They had manna. Every morning arrived, just enough for them. They had experienced the provision of God upon their life. And here they stand now on the promised land that was spoken to them in Exodus chapter 6. Yet here they are standing on the promised land. And it says in the word of God that all they could do was grumble. Parents, you've probably had those days, right? Already on school holidays. Where it's like, would you kids just shut up? No, no, no parents in here? A few nods of the head. Well, this was one of those times where there was two million people and all they were doing was just grumbling, just having a whinge. Oh, yeah, but I had the same manner yesterday. Can't you change the menu? Oh, yeah, my feet hurt. Oh, the tent took me too long to put up today. They go on and say this. It says in Scripture this. They go on and say that being a slave for the Egyptians was really not such a bad thing. Wow. Something happens inside of you when you want to go back to the place where you were, right? Let me say that again. Something has happened inside of you when you look back at the place that was broken and you see that as a place of salvation. We're getting into it. It's the first week of the year. We're going to get into it here. Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. It says this. It says, The Lord now said to Moses, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded. He sent out 12 men all tribal leaders of Israel from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. I want to take a moment to say that God knows your pain, He hears your prayer, and He always has a plan. It just may not be the plan you want, but God always has a plan. Verse 25, switching over to verse 25, says this, After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel in the wilderness, they reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit that they had taken from the land. This was, this was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent to explore, and it is indeed bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is a kind of fruit it produces. But, but the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there. The descendants of Anak, the Amalekites live in the Negev there, and the whole heap of other people live there. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But, there's a lot of buts in here, but the other men, I can just imagine this. Caleb's going, hey, we can do this. We can do this, right? I I was there with you. There's 12 of us. We walked along. I stood with you. I saw them. I saw the giants. I saw the challenges that we're going to face over here. But I also saw the grapes. I saw the the land of milk and honey. I saw the freedom that God promised to us. So Caleb says this, and and the guy said to him, but the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. Oh, They said, we can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they, listen to this. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. I've read this on on so many occasions and I've thought to myself, you ungrateful people. Seriously. You ungrateful people, how dare you spit in the face of God? He took you out of the worst circumstances, provided for you miracles upon your life. He, you now stand on the, on the edge of a promised land and all you can do is grumble and complain and bitch. I thought, how dare you? Then I looked in the mirror. 
In 2013, I'll get the team up, 2013, we had recently moved to Hobart and I started working with Ambulance Taz. The job wasn't exactly what I wanted, but it was stable, allowed me to practice at the highest level possible. My family was healthy, we had money in the bank, we had found a small but clean rental, the kids were, were adapting well into their new schools and their sporting activities. We would found a good church community here. We were lucky enough to even buy a car. I didn't have a career title after my name in this job. But things were good. But I remember being about nine months in. And I couldn't say anything good about my life. I felt like I was stuck here in Hobart. At the time, it did not feel like the promised land, I can promise you that. I'd taken a pay cut of nearly a half to come to Hobart. And Morella was volunteering at the church and I even had to take the metro bus to get to work. I remember walking into Ambulance Tasmania headquarters one morning and I grunted at my PA before going absolutely troppo because my computer decided to do an update just when I wanted to start. Being in, my, in government and being in the position in government that I had it meant I had to enter about 7 billion passwords to get into it. <laughs> at which point, I remember Wayne walked past my office. Wayne was 64 years old. Wayne was from Bothwell. He'd never got married. He never had kids. He lived in the same house as he was born in and he drove, an, a, drove a 28 year old Ford Cortina. Wayne had tried to join, join the ambulance service on seven occasions, but he just didn't have the dexterity to be able to do the job. So he never got the privilege to wear the epaulets to say that you're a paramedic in the state of Tasmania. Instead, Wayne worked as the storeman. And he volunteered at night. In the scheme of it, I was probably Wayne's boss's boss's boss. Yet I remember this day because Wayne walked in and he said to me, knocked on the door, and he said to me, I'm so sorry you're having a bad day. Is there anything I can do for you? I had everything in my life. And he was a 64-year-old guy who heard me whinging, complaining, knocks on my door and says, is there anything I can do for you? The reason I wanted to share from the story of Joseph and Caleb is because I remember going home that night and my devotional just happened to be Numbers chapter 14. And it started with two verses that impacted me so much that I drove to Bothwell that night to meet Wayne, to say I was sorry. Because the scripture says that as a result of the inability for the Israelite leaders to speak life, that the whole community began weeping. It says that the whole community, because 10 of the 12 leaders came back and grumbled and complained and couldn't speak life into anything, it says that the whole community was in tears. It says that they were so affected, so broken, that they just wished they could go back to being in slavery in Egypt. You may have noticed a series of boards on either side of the room. And I felt today that we're going to do something a little bit different. And it might get messy. And it might get difficult. 
But I felt being the first Sunday of the year that I wanted us to take a practical step and to write on the two boards on the side or underneath the one in the middle something that you want to speak life into this year. It might be your marriage. It might be your finances. It might be your health. It might be your children. It might be the church. It might be your job. You don't have to write your name underneath it just to simply write the name. There's Sharpies on either side here. But I can. this is what I've been doing. I came in during the week and I just sat in front of these boards and I prayed. The first one over here, Brody. For me, you can't see it, but it's a picture of our youth team. And for me, I'm speaking life over our next generation. You can't see this one, but it's a, it's, a, it's a connect group we run here of our Asian community. It's about 30 or 40 of them in it. I'm speaking life over our Asian community. What is it for you? What are you speaking life over this year? What's the thing that if, if people asked you, it's like, oh yeah, they just, they just complain about that all the time. What are you going, you know what, this year, I want to speak life on something. This one is a photo of our African community. I'm speaking life over our African community here in Hobart. And this one here is our South Americans. I am speaking life. I am praying for, I am believing in our South American community. I'm going to ask just where you are, just for the next few minutes, you may come up with your children. But it may be something where you just grab a pen and you just write, I am speaking life in this. We're not going to record this part of it that's going to go out. This is simply you writing something. So you may say, I need to speak life into my marriage. I need to speak life into, in, into children. Maybe you haven't been able to have children. You're saying, you know what? God, I want to speak life into this situation in my life. Maybe finances is something that if someone spoke to you, it would always be that, that, that they see you as, oh man, they're talking about that again. That you're going, no, I'm going to speak life into the fact that God will provide for me this year. Maybe it's your health. Wherever you are, just let's start going. Let's just start going. Grab a pen either side and just start writing what it is that you want to speak life into this year. Thank you, Jesus. See
Maybe you just want to stand where you are, just we while you're waiting. Let's just stand, let's start worshiping. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Start declaring it out, my God, that is who you are. You are, you are my way maker. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. estimated the amount of sharpies that we needed. God is good, right? God's filling his house. I know from Roland and I, we've had a dream. We've seen a vision that we will see every church, not just us, that we will see every church with a line of people waiting to get in the door. I don't care what the name is above the door. I just want to see people, as long as they're Jesus-centered, Bible-based and Spirit-led, I want to see them a lineup coming in the door. So I apologize that we underestimated the Sharpies. There's more on this side. If you want to do it, all of those who are lining up over here, if you want to do it, we're going to keep this going for a little bit longer here. But I just want to stop this because we're going to stop the service in just a moment. But I just want to share this. I heard this quote said once. It said, if you had the cure to what seemed to be an incurable disease, wouldn't you share it? Well, as believers, you have the cure to death. So why aren't we shouting it from the mountaintops? Because He is our miracle maker. He is our way maker. He's our miracle worker. The service is officially finished. It's kind of messy. You can do whatever you want. Stop and have a coffee with us. Come up and ride on the board. Spend some time. Do whatever needs to be. Let's just start worshiping. You are our way maker. Way maker. 